Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Broadcasting live from Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn, you're listening to heritageradionetwork.com. following is a message from Jones Family Farms. Looking for that perfect Christmas tree this season? What about the perfect wine to go with your holiday dinner? Look no further than Jones Family Farm, a 400-acre working farm in Connecticut. Jones Family Farms is as passionate about education as it is about farming. Whether you're picking fresh strawberries or exploring local wines, we hope you're inspired to learn more about Connecticut farming. For more information, visit www.jonesfamilyfarms.com. All right, it's Thursday, 1 o'clock, and you are tuned into the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. Today, we are live in studio with the folks of Corbin Hill Road Farm. Uh, we have Tusha Yakovleva, Dennis Derek, the founder, and then want to say big welcome back to Sabrina Walensky, who's been on the show with us before. Welcome to the studio, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's great being back. Yeah, it's great to have you. So it's been a big year for the farm. And I thought before we kind of tuck into what's been going on uh, over 2010, 2011, um, maybe, Dennis, you can take us a little bit through the history of how the farm kind of came to be and what it is exactly that you guys do. Well, you know, we really uh, wanted to transform and reimagine what the relationship would be between, between farmers, between consumers, and between investors. And the nature of this farm was that uh, if we could re-examine this and at the same time uh, supply fresh produce to the communities that were food deserts, that we would really be making a revolutionary transformation. Especially, we consider it particularly revolutionary in the sense that we see this farm, even though it's it's a for-profit venture, socially driven, uh, we see this farm being owned by the community uh, three to five years out once we become profitable. That's awesome. And, and the commu- what are the communities that you're working with? Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, I can. Uh, we're working in the South Bronx in, in five neighborhoods, <coughs> in five uh, community boards, and in Harlem in four neighborhoods. Uh, each of these communities has about 600,000 uh, residents living in them. They're diverse communities, and so that you will find particularly in places like Harlem, even though people think of it as being gentrified, uh, and there are many people with higher incomes, many of them are still living in the food desert. And so that's been part and parcel of of the issues that we've been dealing with. And we must remember that even in Harlem, with the gentrification, most people forget that 33% of the folks uh, living in Harlem are part of the working poor. So is you guys have an actual farm in the Bronx? No, right? I mean, it's up in... Uh, No, our farm is in Schoharie County, which is 40 miles west of Albany. It's in the western Catskills region. Uh, It's a 95-acre farm. Uh, we purchased it in 2009. Mm-hmm. A group of ordinary people got together and purchased the farm. Uh, and since purchasing it, we've completely renovated the existing farmhouse uh, that was on there, and we're working on restoring it to be historically accurate, um, as well as started redeveloping the land so that it would it can produce ve- fruits and vegetables. Uh, the it had been inactive for 10 years? 10 years. 10 years before we bought it. Uh, so there was a lot of, of remediation that we had to do. 
uh, when we just did our first test acre this season, and it is spectacular. Yeah, what did you guys decide to grow on the test acre? Oh, we had everything. Kale, spinach, spinach. Uh, squash, pumpkins. Um, we're also working on developing a small kitchen garden that will be herbs. Um, two, t- two types of squ- squash. We had summer and winter squash. Yeah. Okay. And we're working on uh, preparing the land for strawberries and raspberries uh, in the next two to three years. So you, the farm is kind of just getting going, but you guys have been providing food to the South Bronx over the course of the last year. I mean, how, where, where is that coming from and how, like, how big are we talking? It's a CSA program, basically, for, for low-income residents or... And people living in, in food deserts. Um, well, what Dennis found yeah. out early on... Well, um, you know, it's really interesting. <clears throat> when I started this, the, the intent was that we thought we could actually develop a farm that would uh, reach the, quote, masses okay. <laughs> in these communities. And yeah. then we soon discovered that it takes an awful lot more money, an awful lot more experience, and I will be the first to tell you I'm not a farmer, okay? Uh, what I discovered is that there were some incredible farmers in that particular community who essentially had uh, no markets for their produce okay. and that were willing to work with us. And so two of the largest farmers in that particular county uh, in terms of Scohari Valley Farm and in terms of the... Uh, the Barber Family Farm. The Barber farm. Family Farm uh, got together with two additional farmers, smaller farmers, and uh, were able to supply us for that entire first year. From that, we were able last January to put together a harvest plan. We invited some 11 farmers to join us. Nine altogether joined us, and so they have now been producing all the produce that we have been distributing as part of our farm share. We'll talk about farm share as opposed yeah. to CSA. Farm shares. <laughs> okay. What's the difference? Go ahead. Um, CSA, Community of Supported Agriculture, is the, the, the main model, and it's the idea that the community works with the farmer, and it's a reciprocal benefit. Farm share takes that, the principles of CSAs, but adapts them to meet the needs of lower income communities who have less cash flexibility, you know, are, are more susceptible to, to risk um, and who can't afford to take risks. To share the journalists. risk. I mean, that is really the CSA models at the, uh, is sharing, the, the right. is sharing the risk with the farmer. But with a low income community, how can you ask people to share risk when they're already at high risk? So what we've done is minimized and in some cases eliminated the element of risk for these communities so they can just get the food because at the heart of it, that's what this is about. Uh, And working with a network of farmers has actually helped to minimize that risk, um, which we learned, unfortunately, uh, when Irene hit. Yeah, tell us, how were you guys impacted by that? Well, uh, on the Sunday night, I checked in with the farmers. I I was upstate at that particular time, and the, our two largest farmers said to us, uh, we cannot provide you anything tomorrow uh, for the farm share. And I said, it turns out you could not even get a truck into that area. All right. Uh, one of our smaller farmers had actually delivered all her herbs the day before, and we could not even get to the farm to be able to, where we aggregate all our, all our produce. We could not even get there. However, the farmers on the, on the what I would call, not, on, not in the valley, but mm-hmm. on the hills, were all able to join together in a fairly short space of time and be able to supply us everything that we needed for that Tuesday delivery. And it was mo- quite a miracle because it was pouring rain that Monday night when we were loading the truck. I remember, and, yeah. Uh, but, and when our truck left, uh, the roads into New York City were not yet open. 87 exit 17 was not open. But our driver arrived five minutes after it was opened. <laughs> so, you know, it takes an element of luck. Of but course. I think I think what's important about it is that we, we, we had alternative sources to go to and we did not disappoint a community that had been that had already paid for their goods. And for many of them, you know, you may think twelve dollars is just a small amount, but for them it's a mountain. And so not to disappoint those individuals, but I think made enormous difference. And I think that I mean it's a little bit, Sabrina, what you're talking about is looking at ways to kind of hedge against the <clears> risk <throat> for the community members and then also for the farmers to be able to kind of use each other as resources to, to mm-hmm. fill in the gaps as you go along. So you mentioned the uh, $12. I mean, how, how does a farm share work? I know you guys are, are debuting a winter share this year, and, and I saw from your website that the full price share for that is, it, 
for that share is $240. And then if you're a recipient of the SNAP or food stamp benefits, it's $150. Is that pretty comparable with the share price over the summer? And uh, yeah, well, the two forty actually breaks down to twelve dollars a week. Okay, when you look at it over the course of the entire five month season, so we've kept our prices for the winter consistent, um, and the winter share is structured a little differently than the summer share, just given the nature of it's it's less frequent. We're dealing with more root crops, which are coming from storage, so we have to, you know, put a hold on them um, right. ahead of time. But with the summer share. Um, you, it's it's on a weekly basis. So you pay on a weekly basis rather than all up front. And that is also different from a traditional CSA model. And, and why like why why make that choice? You just have to take a look at the uh, the cash flow of the poor in terms of what they can and cannot afford. I mean, you say, <clears throat> try living on $300 on, in terms of food stamps for a month for a family of four, and I think all of us will lose so much weight, we would think it's the best diet. Well, you would hope so, but I think, I mean, one of the kind of problems in those food it's deserts food. Is, <laughs> is the bad food. So you have, yes. like, these undernourished <laughs> and obese well, residents. Well, that's when, the price you pay. Yeah, that's, that's the price of cheap food. So I'm curious, you guys are a for-profit, you know, organization, and, and the farms that you work with are for-profit, so... You know, there is a $90 difference between the full price share and the SNAP benefit share. So so where where are you making up that $90? Well, it's been made up in a number of ways. Uh, you know, one of the things that we find particularly attractive about our model is the fact that if you can design products and services that, that, that really meet the needs and satisfy the needs of low-income folks, that middle-income folks will take advantage of it. And so we've been able, using that particular principle, to come up with a two-tier pricing structure one at $48 and one at $30, or well, the $30, as I prefer to call it, $1 a day. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's much more saleable that way. But what we're finding is that those who are paying the full share of $48 uh, will be cross-subsidizing uh, those on SNAP. And that is, I mean, I, I know I've definitely heard of other CSA models that, that use that, where it's essentially a kind of a sliding scale to make sure that there's access for everyone. What, um, what has been the risk? I mean, how many, I guess two questions. First, how many shares are we talking about? Uh, this season, uh, we were at about 500 shares a week at our peak. Uh, the numbers fluctuate throughout the summer because of vacations. Uh, and that's double our, our peak enrollment from 2010. So already in one year, we've doubled, and we expect to double the 2011 numbers at least mm -hmm. uh, in 2012. So we're, we're growing Quickly, yeah. yeah, very quickly. What is, I mean, what a, what does that look like as far as scalability? I mean, the farmers you're currently working with can double with you, or you'll be looking for new yes. farmers, or we will we won't we would like to include new farmers in terms of Skahari simply because uh, uh, it's really opening up access for all the farmers and not just the domination of one or two or the dependence upon the three or four farmers. So that this year we probably will invite about half a dozen more. And hopefully we'll end up with about maybe 12 to 15 farmers. But it's a slow growth. And with the adding new farmers, it's not just adding products and, and availability to our roster, but it's also giving them an opportunity to try new crops that they haven't necessarily grown before. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our farmers, Jack Singer of Denali Farm, joined us this season. And for the first time, we were able to have tomatillos and okras, which mm -hmm. none of our other farmers were growing. And he'd never grown before or hadn't grown in, in large quantities and wanted an opportunity to try it out. So it, we're giving an opportunity to not just reach a new market, but really expand there. Yeah, their one, of our, one of our big things has to do with the, you know, when we talk about accessibility, uh, we're thinking also in terms of cultural relevance of the food, and that's part of it. And so having farmers who want to try new, new, new uh, produce items that reflect the culture, that they've been willing to grow, but they've never had a market up there to, right. to, to, which to grow, sell it. Well, and I think that's one of those things about providing food and, and creating systems that are really sustainable in the long term is you have to be sensitive to so many factors, the price, the access, you know, the ability for people to store them, but also is it is it culturally appropriate? And I, I know from one of the Times articles I was looking at that you guys probably get a lot of requests for things that just can't be grown in this region, like, <laughs> you know, plantains or mangoes, mangoes, pineapple. And, so I, I don't know, and maybe Tusha, you can chime in a little bit here as far as what what role have you guys played on um, both, I think, you know, bringing in stuff that the community is asking for, but also educating them on stuff that, that grows really well or, or fits well into the share here that the community may not be as familiar with. 
Um, well, uh, one, one thing that's different this year is that each of our sites have a site leader during distribution, and they really educate the, all the consumers about each product and the history of it and why, you know, why it's there and why it's there at the particular moment in the season. And we also provide um, recipes every week, so that helps uh, with the introduction of, of new crops. And, yeah. and the recipes are, are simple. They're, they're things you can do in 20 minutes. Um, our favorite is roasting. We, we can roast anything. Right. Um, we do roast everything. And some things you don't expect. Peaches, for example, fantastic roasted. So we do a lot of roasting recipes, a lot of easy soups, easy salads, things that are simple. So that way, if you say, I don't know how to prepare it, we have something quick in our back pocket. And we also like to show how one item can be used in three different ways okay. and across existing recipes. So how you can substitute you know, kale for chard or for collards and really r- highlight the range that each produce item has. Well, you know, I, the thing that I chuckle about this summer in terms of new items has to do with something like garlic scapes that became, oh, yeah. abs- that became absolutely the hit uh, amongst all of the sites that we were distributing. And uh, our farm our, our produce manager actually made uh, a dip, uh, which he sent down to all the sites, and people just absolutely ate it up. And, you know, scapes lasted about six weeks, and folks then said, where are the scapes? Where are the scapes? <laughs> I know, and they're so cool looking, too. I, I mean, know. I think there's, like, real opportunity to engage people just even... On the way they look, I know I, I'm a big fan of the garlic scape bracelet during the season. <laughs> I like kind of walk around smelling like I'm mm. warding off vampires. Well, <laughs> awesome. We're going to take a quick break and then come back and learn a little bit more about the happenings up at the farm. It's what I always wanted. Could never have too many We're bringing it back. You are tuned into the Farm Report, and we are live in studio with the folks from Corbin Hill Road Farm. So, you know, we talked about the community, a little bit about the community you're working in and the farmers you partner with, but but you guys work with a lot of other organizations. Can you tell us a little bit um, about some of the partners you work with? Yes. Uh, I think one of the things that is really important has to do with the fact that as part of our whole philosophy around sovereignty, uh, we are really interested in, in, in the issue of where food is, gets distributed. And one of the ways in which we can understand that distribution is to understand who our partners are. So that, for instance, if you begin with Broadway housing uh, that, <coughs> that serves uh, <coughs> excuse me, all uh, ex- folks who were formerly homeless, or you would deal with a fortune society, fortune society where you have uh, folks who were formerly who are ex-offenders, uh, uh, you begin to understand the, 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 the groups of folks that we live with, with, that we work with. So that you go to the Bronx and we deal with the Wedcos, uh, it deals with all of the women economic development piece, the way they have a 
Head Start program there. They have housing programs. They have a whole variety of programs. So a lot of the demographics are reflected in the organizations that we associate and work with um, very much. And we also work with organizations um, not just on the basis of who they serve, but who works for them. So, for example, Urban Health Plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were All of our shareholders came from their medical and administrative staff. Okay. Uh, we also work with Inner Church Center, which has 70 plus. Mm-hmm. 70 plus. Um, ecumenical and social justice related organizations. So we're, we're distributing to the people who are helping to to combat so, you know, social justice injustices. And they, re- they act as really great wo- role models. So that, uh, for instance, you will find that in the case of Urban Health, where we worked this year for the first time, uh, working with their staff, that next year what they intend to do is to extend this out to the community and the folks that they do serve. Uh, they function in public schools. They, f- they, f- they have, what, a half a dozen variety of programs that they're, that, that they're very much involved with, and they become part and parcel of that entire community within that community that we will be serving. Okay, so, I mean, there is a little bit of this, you know, if you build it, they will come. So you guys, you know, had this idea, you started this farm. How... How you and then you partner with these organizations, but at kind of at the beginning, or even as you look to you know double your number of um, you know shareholders, how do you reach out to these communities, and how is that different? Do you think than you know other other areas of the city or other ways of kind of creating access to food? Well, it's a, it, it's a multi pronged approach. I mean, say for for example, one of the things that we really believe in is the fact that you don't go into communities to organize communities. The communities are already organized, and you have to find out who organized that particular portion of the community. Okay. And they become our greatest marketers. So that if you take something like urban health, where they serve maybe 30,000 people, and they have them organized in a whole variety of different programs, who am I or who are we to say that we're going to do this? So the importance, of, the importance in terms of our marketing is that the leadership of these organizations share the same values that we do, and then join us in terms of being able to do the marketing internally with, for themselves. And so that becomes one model. A second model that I would describe has to do with the fact that within neighborhoods, uh, there are folks that are just hungry looking for fresh produce. And if you can get the information out to them, we actually run some distribution centers ourselves. Uh, and you know, when you think of these communities, you think of them in terms of clusters of residents. And they all talk to each other, and they're all within walking distance of the distribution site. And the word gets around very fairly quickly. I mean, say, we, we run Thurgood Marshall. You might want to describe it. Uh, yeah, we have a site at uh, Thurgood Marshall Academy, which is on West 135th. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it's, it's one of the sites that we run by ourselves. And it's grown just by word of mouth. Um, just by word of mouth. We really don't do a lot of big advertising. It's old school flyers. We have flyers. We have postcards. Neighbors shove pieces of paper under their neighbors' doors. Uh, you know, something may be said at a church meeting or in a, a newsletter. But it's really person to person has been our biggest growth. And of course, the produce sells itself. Right. When you see the produce laid out at a site, it's pretty hard to resist. And so the site. I mean, how it works is you guys have these different sites, and basically you you gather all the food in a central location, then you divide it site by site, and then on kind of pickup day. There's different spots around the city where people go to, to pick up their share for that week, right? Right. And we, we try to make each site an event. Um, Tusha has been really great at really helping to build that experience. Um, we did some samples at a couple of our sites this year that were a big hit with the garlic scapes, roasted squash, you name it. We, we probably roasted it and served it. <laughs> um, we also had site leaders this year, which is a big change for us. Uh, we had a, a field staff of between 12 and 16 people who are at the site, who can answer questions, really engage people, and be our representatives in the field while, you know, our small office staff tried to do everything else. Do other questions. So, Dennis, I know you, your background is in academia, correct? You're a, you were an instructor at the new school before you launched this program. Still am. And still are. So, <laughs> I know that, you know, I, I believe you're teaching a course for graduate students next <laughs> spring, and I am just wonder if you can talk a little bit about you know, the role of academia in reaching these communities. I know there's been a a tremendous rise in interest among students at at graduate schools in New York. 
and and wondering how your organization has partnered with that and if you work with any other institutions. Yes, uh, and I think, you know, one has to begin by thanking uh, the new school for giving me the kind of freedom to be able to do this. I'm one of the few professors in, at the Milano School who's a professor of professional practice, and quite frankly, the stuff that I'm teaching, I'm really practicing right now. And so I have to, pre- I have to give them the thanks for that. But beyond that... Uh, what happens is that some of these, some, the work that I'm doing gets translated into the classroom. So that this particular semester, one of the things that we're doing, we, we were running a course called Barriers to Food Access, looking at the supply side uh, upstate. Can upstate, re- do the farmers upstate have the capacity to really supply uh, Corbin Hill Farm or uh, even other farms the quantity of produce that is really needed in this community? And how would we get it to them? You know, so that becomes a course in, in and of itself. We're also working with Cobleskill, uh, SUNY Cobleskill. They have an incredible array of greenhouses. And one of the things that we have with the winter shear is how do we get uh, greens, uh, lettuce, and so forth uh, to the community? And they've taken it upon themselves in terms of a demonstration project to actually grow uh, lettuce and other greens for us. Uh, this is a first-time project for them. But again, the involvement of the academia where they basically can talk about the issues, but now they're doing acting on it. Nice, so they're making that transition. And I mean, I think that's like something so neat and something I also, as a student at the New School, really appreciate is the you're kind of hands-on really using the city at, as a laboratory. And you guys are also, I mean, one of the other things I noticed in your site you're working with uh, Dr. Cindy Shelley doing a lamb share this year. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about the decision to bring meat on and, and maybe some of the challenges uh, around that? Sure. Well, uh, Cindy's actually a neighbor of ours um, up in Schoharie, uh, right down Route 20. Yep, five miles away. Five miles away. Uh, and so we got to know her, and, you know, she had great lambs. I've met them. <laughs> They're adorable. And yeah, and goats, too. I mean, we she was a real big help with the No yeah. Goat Left Behind project that we ran in October. I had a great, great meeting with the goats. <laughs> and it just came about that the idea of having lamb as an offering for city residents sounded like a really great idea. So we're doing a one-time delivery of lamb on January 20th. Uh, you can purchase lamb by the half, and it comes fully butchered, I believe, in the, uh, the prime cuts. Mm-hmm. Um, organs are available for those who desire. And it's, it's, it was one of those decisions where we didn't have a reason not to do it. Right. Uh, although our, our heart is, is with the vegetables and the fruit, you can't deny that there's a meat industry in New York State People that needs to People love to eat meat, too. Well, <laughs> yeah. the, other, the other side to that, too, is the cultural dimension. You, you find that uh, in terms of what we ha- the, the individuals we have in Harlem, uh, reflecting, you know, uh, both the West Africans and the Caribbean community and numbers of other communities, that there was, everyone come talk, talking, you know, why don't you bring some lamb back? And so we decided just to tease the, the group. Yeah. And so we, we decided that we would bring 15 shares down, and we're halfway through selling all of them. Yeah. yeah. And how, I mean, I know, I know from working on the GOAT project that one of the challenges of, of working with me, and especially when you're doing something on, you know, a smaller scale like that is, is pricing. You know, you have not only to pay the farmer a fair price for the lamb, but then to play to, to have it slaughtered and then to pay to have it, you know, broken down into those pieces and, and really still be able to offer that at an affordable price. I mean, is that something you guys have struggled with or people are responsive to the price or? The people have been responsive to the price. Um, I would say that we, we are, Cindy decided to determine the price that we were going to pay. <laughs> uh, the price for butchering is a fixed price. Right. All of these things were added in. And uh, what, it, what it really comes down to is, you know, what kind of margin we were looking for. We did a comparative piece with some of the other supermarkets, which I won't name, uh, in terms of all of the different parts for the lamb. And we came out way ahead, even though we were going to make a small, modest profit. Sure. But it's a learning experience for us. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, you guys have undergone this tremendous growth since you were last on the show, and it seems like... You know, in the short time that you've existed, like each year it brings on these totally new and unexpected dimensions. And, and maybe if each of you could talk a little bit about some of the uh, surprising growing pains, you know, that that came up or things where you like change direction and, and how maybe that turned into like an unexpected strength for the organization. Well, uh, let's bring a go on the operation side, and then I'll talk about the financial side. Okay. <laughs> um, from an operational side, just staffing was was a huge, huge change for us. Um, last year, we were running with 
a very small staff, the number of which could take up less than four fingers. Um, (laughs) And so when we grew, we realized we needed more human capital to really make the growth happen because the farm shares a very human experience. And while we'd like to think that everything can be done electronically and, you know, over the phone or by email, you still need that person in a space at the end of the day to help people with their shares. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've been learning about what it takes to, to grow and to staff that growth. Right. Uh, in terms of the financial side, one of the things that we're faced with a very set of what I call multiple contradictory objectives. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm already yeah. confused. <laughs> no, this is the whole point. Here we are. We have to make it affordable. But at the same time, we know what's going on in New York City in terms of, in terms of income and poverty. And so we have to raise prices. And at the same time, what's affordable? How do you raise prices? How do you create value? Because one of the things we do is we do create enormous value. We compare our prices with, with that at the supermarkets each week. And I can talk about that separately. And then with that, we, we, in order to be sustainable, we have to be financially sound. Yeah. And so we're doing all of this. Yes, we raise prices, but how do we do it in a very creative kind of way? And how do we maximize subsidies? And how do we leverage subsidies and so forth And at the same time? So all of these are the pieces that we're really kind of playing with. You know, uh, if you were in a formal class, I'll talk about it in terms of cost of goods and so forth. But sure, we'll <laughs> sure. We'll save that for the next show. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I find really interesting about looking at, at, at creating more access to food, especially in these areas um, in urban environments that are food deserts is, you know, there has to also be this multi-pronged approach. I mean, getting the vegetable share once a week is not going to meet a family's food needs. So you are dependent on supermarkets or, or other markets. And I mean, how do you guys see yourselves like fitting in to like a, a greater like framework a, a, of food access? And what do you think are some opportunities that you kind of, if you had a magic wand, you'd be like, I really wish someone would just do this. Well, I think I think in the long run, one of the things that we talk about is that uh, our shareholders really act as economic citizens and not just clients, because we do not view them as clients, and that really the f- more sophisticated consumer is really an economic citizen. One of the groups that we're working with right now in terms of talking about financial uh, management and planning for the communities really has begun, they've begun to, in- to introduce the concept of value, what they're getting, what else they will need in terms of their... Uh, to purchase in order to feed the family and how you budget within these things. This is the kind of educational piece that just has to be done. We know that, you know, you cannot walk out of there with the $12 and think that that's going to feed you for the week. Right. You know, and so, but how do you, how do you say, I want to spend this $12 as opposed to, well, it's so difficult. But then you end up going to the supermarket, or the, I call them the grocery stores, not the supermarkets. Uh-huh. Uh, and you end up paying $21 for the same set of items. Right. Right, so there are some, like some cost comparisons yes. there. Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, we are about out of time, but I, I did want to give you guys a chance to. I know you have some some new stuff coming up on your website, and maybe sharing a little bit. If people want to get involved with uh, your work, is there opportunities for volunteering? How do they find you? You know, any other kind of things that are up and coming that people should be aware of? Uh, well, all the information will be on our new and improved and expanded website and blog, CorbinHillFarm.com. Um, we're going to have job opportunities, internship opportunities. If you're a designer or videographer, we're going to have opportunities, as well as just signing up for a share, which is really the best way to get involved with Corbin Hill is to become part of Corbin Hill. And today until midnight, uh, you can sign up for our first delivery on December 13th, as well as for the lamb share. Um, we'll be accepting uh, memberships in that for the next few days. Awesome. Well, Dennis, Sabrina, Tisha, thank you so much for coming in today. This has been another episode of The Farm Report on the Heritage Radio Network. Tune in next week at 1 o'clock to hear more about what's going down.